what was the Seralini study? And if you could tell us about that and why it's important. The Seralini study was one of the most important studies done to date. And it's a study that if, if it had not been viciously attacked and misrepresented, if the facts about that study had been clearly transmitted to the press and then from the press to the public, again, the whole venture to genetically engineered food would be in its death spiral, if not already dead. That study was performed in 2012. I'm sorry, it was performed earlier, it was published in a peer-reviewed uh, scientific journal in 2012. And it was a very, very well designed study and a long overdue study because it was a long-term study. There have been very few long-term studies conducted by independent scientists, scientists independent of industry influence on a genetically engineered food. And they were, mo the Seralini, he wasn't the only scientist conducting it. He was working with a team of university researchers in Europe, many of them at the University of Cain, some in the United Kingdom. There might have been a few other countries involved. But they had noticed that a disturbing trend in the, in the studies that had been done on genetically engineered food, even when there had been some feeding studies done, and that's the, that was actually the minority of the cases, there had been statistically significant differences that were dismissed by the researchers as scientifically uh, insignificant, not biologically significant, and, uh, or changes that were, that were troubling, that were nearing the level of statistical significance, but changes especially troubling in liver signs that could have been the precursors of liver and kidney toxicity. And that's important, as the research has emphasized, because the livers and the kidneys uh, are the, are the uh, basic, they help take, they help screen toxins out of our body. They have to, if we're ingesting toxins, especially uh, in a chronic way, day after day, month after month, the livers and the kidneys are basically there to defend against them. But they can be constrained and stressed because of that. And so signs of liver and uh, kidney stress and toxicity are worrying and should be paid attention to. They've been dismissed as, as biologically insignificant. So the, through 90-day tests, in fact, Monsanto had done a 90-day test on one of their most widely planted varieties of corn, technically called NK603, which is in the food supply in a big way, and by the way, corn, for people who may be listening to this in other countries, you would be calling it maize. Here in the United States, we refer to it as corn, but maize is more the, the agricultural name, technical name. So the, Monsanto had conducted a 90-day test on this variety of maize. It, it had been genetically engineered to be resistant, tolerant to round, the Roundup herbicide that Monsanto uh, cells, glyphosate being the active ingredient. So Monsanto had done the test, and in reviewing the Monsanto test data, these researchers had again noticed there were some troubling signs uh, uh, to the kidney, kidneys and to the livers of the test animals that Monsanto had dismissed as being not biologically uh, significant. So they wanted to repeat the study, but do it for two years long term to see because they felt these signs were precursors of problems that might manifest through the long term. And after all, people, are, human beings have been eating uh, GMOs long term. And certainly little kids, small kids that started eating GMOs in 1996 and have been eating them repeatedly and are now not little kids anymore, that's been long term. They wanted to study what happens when you take very young rats and feed them through two years, which is a long-term cycle for a rat. And that hadn't been done before, at least not with that variety of GMO, that NK603. They wanted to study it. But they designed their study, they followed through with, they replicated Monsanto's study 
in the respects that was important, using the same stra strain of laboratory rat, uh, the same strain of GMO corn, but they made it even more rigorous. Besides doing it for two years, they decided to test not only the genetically engineered corn that had been sprayed with Roundup, as it would be sprayed under normal agricultural conditions, they also tested corn that had not been sprayed at all, the genetically engineered corn that had not been sprayed to see if there was something problematic in the genetic engineering process itself or in the gene, specific gene that had been used. They also tested the Roundup separately from the corn to see if there was a problem with Roundup independent of the corn. So there were three basic experimental groups, rats that were that were given the fed the genetically engineered corn that had been sprayed with Roundup under normal field conditions, the genetically engineered corn that had not been sprayed, and the component of the spray, the Roundup, in, uh, independent of the corn, just added to the rat's drinking water in the typical dose they would have received if they'd been ingesting the genetically engineered corn that had been sprayed. And what they found was, over two-year term, statistically significant uh, signs of liver toxicity and kidney toxicity that were not just precursors of it, but the real thing. They found toxicity had been caused to the liver and the kidneys, and also in some uh, cases to other organs, but those definitely were showing it. And um, all three categories of experimental animals, those that didn't eat the corn at all and only a small dose of glyphosate, those that ate the corn without the Roundup, and those that ate the corn that was sprayed with Roundup, they all showed toxicity. Very, very powerful. Now, they also found uh, that there were, was an unusual incidence of growth of tumors in the experimental rats. And because in a toxicity study, any tumors that are detected are supposed to be reported. So they reported them. But it was not a carcinogenicity study. It was a toxicity study. They reported the toxic results. They also reported the tumors they observed because that is according to the protocol. Now, when that study was, and that study passed peer review, got published, and unsurprisingly, Monsanto orchestrated a major attack against it. And Monsanto wanted to be operating behind the scenes. So they got some of the scientists that they can usually get to front for them and to, to write letters to the editor of the journal, to write papers attacking it, opinion pieces. And so there's this concerted attack from pro-GMO pro scientists who were in league with Monsanto. So at least 140 scientists, independent of that influence, wrote a letter, open letter, I believe it was an open letter, certainly a document stating that it was a sound study and that they stood be, they agreed it was a sound study. So there's this back and forth attacks, other scientists saying, no, it's a good study. Eventually, after uh, months and months of sustained attack on the journal, pressure applied to the journal editor, and the, uh, the appointment to the, to the editorial board of a former Monsanto scientist, then eventually there was a retraction because the, the, the uh, Monsanto and the scientists working with it were pressuring for, for retraction. They finally retracted it. But here's an interesting fact the retraction didn't follow the standard guidelines for retraction. The, the reasons that the journal's editor gave did not fit the criteria that are supposed to be the only criteria justifying retraction of a paper from a scientific journal. Um, so once, he real, once that was pointed out, he had to try to come up with another reason. But the, the reason he gave was uh, inconclusive results, but of the tumor of the tumor data, not of the toxicity data. Now, and here's an important point. In fact, when he retracted, when the journal editor retracted the study, he acknowledged that the toxicity, the results of the toxicity study were accurate, 
were valid, were reliable. He only focused on the carcin the, and I shouldn't even say carcinogenicity because the researchers never said anything about cancer. They just reported the tumors. They didn't study them to see if they were cancerous or benign. So he accused the researchers, the retraction of unjustifiably stating that genetic engineering uh, could uh, run the risk of cancer. They hadn't even mentioned cancer. And he said those results were inconclusive. So inconclusivity is not a valid, not valid grounds for attracting study. What happened then is the pro-GMO scientists, not just those who were in league with Monsanto, but even the uh, National Academy of Science, the British Royal Society, in their reports, when they talk about the Seralini study, they don't mention the validity, the, the reliability of the, to of the toxic results, toxicology results. They focus on the tumors and say those results were inconclusive. And in fact, the now because it was a solid study, it was uh, ex republished in another peer-reviewed scientific journal a few years later. Now the Royal Society, when it mentioned that study in a uh, briefly, it just mentioned it had been retracted. Didn't mention it had been republished, even though uh, its its report came out a few years after it had been republished. That's fraud. The study was republished. All they did was they cited it, that it was uh, retracted without citing it was repub re republished. That's the Royal Society of the UK, the world's oldest, most respected scientific organization, behaving as if it were in league with Monsanto. And I, I have no evidence, and I'm not even, I don't mean to imply that Monsanto has been in any way paying off the Royal Society. They didn't need to because those scientists, unfortunately enough of them, are so psychologically, ideologically wedded to genetic engineering, they go to bat for the likes of Monsanto and Dubant without even having to be pushed because they are, they are trying to protect the image of genetic engineering because they have become somehow convinced in themselves that genetic engineering equates with science. And if anybody crit criticizes GMOs, they're criticizing science. That's ridiculous. Genetic engineering is a technology. It's applied science, and it's not even being applied well. It's not science applied well. And uh, so, but it's very important to understand. And the National Academy of Science, their 2016 report, when they, they claimed there, were, there was no, no uh, evidence of GMOs ever harming any, creating any harm to any animal, well, <laughs> How did they handle the uh, how did they handle the Cirillini two year study? They focused. They played the game that everybody else is playing. They focused only on the tumor results. They said they were inconclusive. They did this whole analysis of the tumor results, and they completely pushed aside, brushed aside the valid toxicological studies. If you read that report, anybody who reads it would not even know there were valid toxicological studies in the Cirillini study. And I have talked, I've actually had a meeting with the chairman of the uh, committee that wrote that report and brought that point to him and kept driving that home. And he still, he still basically is claiming, no, no, we did a good job. We acted responsibly. The Mexican Academy of Science, they also did the same thing. In a book they published, Promoting GMOs, they talked about Serolini and how what an inconclusive study in it you would not ever know that, that, uh, the, uh, that the editor of the journal acknowledged there were reliable toxicological study findings. And yet in Mexico, which relies on maize, on corn, far more than any other country in the world, and, and scientists have found out that the Mexican food supply, corn supply in the greater Mexican city area, the the corn flour, the tortillas, and there's one other ingredient that's commonly used, they're all contaminated with that NK603. That if the scientific community had acted responsibly, wouldn't be in any food supply. And yet here's the Mexican Academy of Science claiming that it's upholding science 
allowing that contamination to continue because they say that corn is safe. And they cite the Seralini study as a bogus study, as a bad study, and uh, you know that's what's going on in the name of science. It's really astounding. It's really astounding. And the Mexican Academy of Science is aware of my critique, of the critiques that have been made. I've brought that to their attention. They know about the critiques showing that the toxicological results were valid. It was a valid toxicological study. They will not change their tune. They continue to claim Serolini's study is a bad study. And they continue to promote GMOs. And uh, it's just astounding what's going on in the name of science.